What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Central Virginia Sport Performance Podcast. I am your host, Jay DeMeo, and today I am fired up to be able to catch up with my good buddy, Mike Wadango. Mike, what's up, bro? Bro, thank you so much for having me on. And and the invite to the seminar. I mean, I'd, I'd said on the last podcast, like, what, what an honor it was um, to, to potentially be on something like that. Like, that, that was, like, my goal, like, at coming up. Going to your podcast, uh, going to your seminars, and and seeing the speakers there, it's it's really awesome to be to be one of the speakers. I'm 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 so honored, um, so flattered. It's so cool. Yeah, man, I'm stoked to be able to have you down in Richmond, July fifteenth and sixteenth. It's going to be a really awesome weekend, and really, I, I'm fired up for a few things, man. Like I think the lineups are going to be really great. I, you know, you've got some really great people that are going to be there sharing and you know, pushing the envelope here with what we do, but even more so, dude, to, to not have to do this, you know, like, yeah. I just can't wait to be like, hey, welcome to the seminar and not have to say, so in case of a fire drill, or please remember to mute when you come into the room, or, you know, like all of those things, uh, it'll be nice to say, just, yo, know, check your phones and make sure they're on vibrate, you know? Yeah. It'd be so nice to say that again. So who's who's on the Pittsburgh lineup? Pittsburgh is Hank Boo, Anthony Paroli. You Molly got Boo? Boy. Come again? You got Boo? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I'm talking to Boo tomorrow too, so that's always great. Boo's Boo's awesome. Uh Molly Benetti, uh Brajesh, and Moyer. So that'll be uh It'll be fun, man. And, you know, like that location up there is really, um, I don't know how they came up with this idea around Union Fitness, but like Hammer's Gym is like, it's like three different gyms, which is neat. And then they have this really cool, like basically like rental temporary office space where there's like all these different offices and different workspaces that you can take out. And then there's just this massive theater like connected to it. Um, it's going to be dope. Like I'm, I'm stoked to be up there. I'm, I'm absolutely. So my kid is born April 17th is the due date. Um, when, when is the seminar? That one's the 29th and 30th and then July 15th, 16th in Richmond. So my, my wife might try to murder me, but I don't, I don't want to miss Hank. I don't want to miss boo. And I haven't seen Anthony. Anthony's a buddy of mine because of, because of buddy, buddy Morris. Um, and I don't, I, I haven't seen him in years because of the whole COVID thing. I want to come up there so bad. I want, and I want to hear, I want to meet boo. I haven't met him because I've been listening to his stuff for years. Haven't met him. I really, I, that's, I'm, I'm, I'd be excited to, to hear his stuff and, and Hank shit. I've never met him either. Yeah, it'll be fun, man. It, it's it's really a neat spot too. Like the hotel that we're staying at is like you can literally look into PNC, like into the park. Like it's like it it's like it's super Pittsburgh. Like it's just cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just a cool spot and a cool location and all that. But but no, man, let, let let's catch everybody up with what's going on down at Freak Strength and you know, with the podcast and everything, like. It's been about eight months, Mike. What's what's new? Let's catch up with Budanga. So, hey, what's what's new at Freak Strength? Well, nothing, absolutely nothing. It's 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 business business as usual, man. Um, we we have our athletic population, we have our adult population. You know, the the gen the gen pop is it's what's interesting. It's actually it's actually shrinking um, since since the whole COVID thing our general population has been less, but I mean, our athletes have been through the roof. So, I mean, every single year I become a specialist in a new sport. Um, you know, I, it's when I first started, I was the baseball guy because I had, a, I was a baseball player. So I had a couple of pro pro pitchers when I first started and people were like, Oh, go to Guadango. He, he knows baseball. He's a baseball guy. And then I started training, um, Joe Torsha, who was a tight end with, uh, UVA and, and the skins for a minute. And he had some shoulder stuff. So I started working with him. Um, Justin Tratow, who had an ankle with the giants and then Chris Hogan, who was, you know, someone we did with our, 
with the pro day training, uh, combine training. And then all of a sudden I became a football guy and I didn't know anything about baseball. And then I did, you know, five, five, six, seven years, maybe 10 years. I don't know, of football stuff where I was the NFL guy. And then I started training Kevin Love and then I became a basketball guy. I didn't know anything about football or baseball anymore. And now, you know, I have, I have a professional golfer, so I can't wait to, you know, be a guy that doesn't know anything about football, basketball, or baseball again, and only know anything about golf. So we, you know, I have, I have a couple of golfers in, um, you know, I, former pro amateurs, and then also uh, a golfer on the LPGA tour now. And she came in with a ton of pain and tried to work through that to get her ready for stuff. That's, that's an exciting project. That'll be fun because she has like a month off before she has two tournaments. And the, it's, it's interesting that the physical preparation, the general physical prep of this golfer in particular, who is a top, a top 30 golfer uh, in the LPGA tour, been around for 10 years, like a stud. And I mean, can't do a basic hip circuit. Lunges seem okay. Um, very, very, very weak general preparation. Very, very weak general prep. And they're, they're so specified or she happens to be so spe specialized and specified in, in her training that she's amazing at golf. But now it's no longer, it's like the difference between idiosyncrasies versus asymmetries. And now it stopped being idiosyncratic and it is asymmetrical. So when, when you have throwing athletes or asymmetrical athletes, unilateral athletes, uh, you know, you, you look at my right shoulder, my right shoulder sloped down more than my left. And that's not because I have a hyperactive trap on my left side. I don't have any rotator cuff issues. I'm a former baseball player. So the eccentric trauma from releasing the de constant deceleration causes my scap to sit lower. If you look at my humerus on my right versus my left, that's a sports adaptation. I have humeral retroversion because it facilitates external rotation I did that at a young age. Those are asymmetries that are sports adaptations, but they're not... And, and, but they're, idi they're, they're not necessarily idiosyncratic in that sense. The idiosyncratic is more like when it just comes out of the norm. But it's still an asymmetry that you don't want to fix. There are asymmetries that you want to fix and asymmetries that you don't want to fix. I don't want both my shoulders at even height because that's a maladaptation for the optimization of sport. So understanding the difference between the two is important. And what I, what I had done with uh, this golfer, she came in with, agonizing neck pain. Um, couldn't, couldn't look left, couldn't look right, couldn't look up, couldn't look down, and couldn't play in the tournament. So our goal was to identify what the main issue was, what it all stemmed from. I mean, and it's something like a subscapularis. So when any kind of swinger, baseball players, it's called swinger shoulder, where they have that high finish, and that high finish got popular with like Alex Rodriguez, where they let go with the back arm or the, the top hand, and the top arm or the bottom hand, excuse me, bottom hand comes through and that huge long lever, if it doesn't break at the elbow, doesn't break at the wrist, all the stress goes to the shoulder. And that leads to anterior translation of the humerus or an anterior subluxation, which is really, really common. And what does that do? That causes the subscapularis to be all jacked up. That's the adaptation that occurs. So then you have these guys that are internally rotated and that shoulder sitting anteriorly, right? So she had something similar where same thing with uh, an NHL player. If they go in for a shot and they open up too soon and hit the ice too hard, that back shoulder is going to anteriorly, trans anteriorly translate and have the same exact thing. Golfer, what happens? You hit too much of the grass, boom, and they're lanky. They have no muscle on them, or I shouldn't say no muscle, but they have substantially less muscle. They're not as robust because the sport doesn't call for it. So any kind of trauma outside of the norm is going to cause issue. So... Same thing happened to her. She had on her back arm, she had a swinger shoulder situation where it was subscapularis causing neck pain. So we worked a ton on strengthening that subscap. Um, you, you remember Michael Hope? Oh, yeah. Yeah, back from the old elite FTS uh, Q&A. Still mm -hmm. at the Syracuse? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, Michael Hope is, I've had him on the podcast, and he's, to me, is a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge. Um, he's a physical therapist that doesn't lay his hands on patients ever. And you bill the most as a PT for insurance when you do manuals. So every PT will do seven and a half minutes, eight minutes of manual therapy. So you could block, so you could bill for, you know, a block, which is 15 minutes of manual therapy 
every single session, they'll put their hands on you for a minimal amount of time just so you can bill for it. A lot of them will. Um, and he doesn't address anything with, with any kind of manual exercise, any, any manual movements or manipulations. He doesn't, he doesn't put his hands on patients. All he does is subscribe or prescribe exercises for them. And one of the ways he'll do it is he'll say, yeah, I mean, three sets of 10 is great. Three sets of 10 every other day, right? Like, what does that get you? At the end of, at the end of a week, that's nine, nine sets, maybe 12 sets. Like that's, that's not a lot. Whereas if you do one set of 10 every hour on the hour that you're awake, now you got eight sets in the, in the day and you do that every single day until the pain starts subsiding and you do it at, uh, you know, obviously, and he does, he does long lever, short lever. That's how he looks at things, which is brilliant. Um, so he'll do one set of 10 every hour, or one set of five, whatever the person can do. It's all about building work capacity on that short lever, as much work capacity as possible in as little time as possible that they can sustain and grow from. So if everything hurts except this, then except basic internal external rotation, then that's what we're going to fucking do. And we're going to do that every chance that we get. And we're going to do it to the point where it just becomes, this is your new norm and you're going to get stronger that way. And then eventually we're going to increase the degree of difficulty to go longer lever. Brilliant. So I did that approach with her for the subscapularis and neck pain started going away substantially, substantially. Um, I do a ton of body work, you know, massage or twi na, as we call it in acupuncture or in Chinese medicine. I do a ton of twi na, um, or, you know, scraping, um, any kind of scraping or uh, what, what is it called? Gua sha is what we do, which is, you know, same thing as instrument assisted soft tissue massage. Minimal though, right? Like I didn't have flushing, basic, long strokes, anything that promoted blood flow. And the main thing that helped was just getting the rotator cuff, the subscapularis substantially stronger. And that was because of an asymmetry that was a maladaptive asymmetry. So that's, to me, that was, it was, that, that's a lot of fun. I like, I like problem solving in that fashion. That's awesome. Cause then if you don't, A, first, that's a hard distinguishing thing to make, right? Because understanding the difference between a maladaptation and what we used to call back in the day, right? is like functional hypertrophy, mm -hmm. right? You know, like we're old enough to be able to say things like that, um, that we still probably don't necessarily know what they mean, but we kind of know what they mean. Um, but then looking at it and how it can go south, it just like makes me think of when Bondarchuk was here and he was walking and it's like, like he looks like he's walking like verbal Kent and the usual suspects. Like he can't move like one of his legs, right? Like his hip doesn't like, do anything and it's just from all those blocks over and over and over from throwing that hammer and teaching that technique and it's like i mean obviously it was pretty successful you know so who who am i to, to judge <laughs> um, but like being able to distinguish where those lines are you know like yeah it might be a little too much you know obviously when you can't move your head you know that's mm -hmm probably time to get something looked at but you know long term there's always those negative ramifications you know it's it's a tough realization um for sport coaches and for athletes to come to to genuinely understand that sport mastery and physical health don't go hand in hand um and and a a perfect example is the bondarchuk situation where it's a guy that's achieved sports mastery to the highest level himself. And so have majority of his, not majority, but he's coached a lot of athletes that have. Um, and I mean, you, you remember Werner Guntor, remember those workouts where, I mean, the guy's doing, you know, squat jumps over hurdles with like a 220 with, with, with hundred kilos, you know, and what was his limiting factor was a lower back, lower back issue, which is what got him out of his career essentially. Um, I've had NFL guys that genuinely don't believe that they can play offensive line without benching 405 that run themselves out of the league because of elbow issues. Um, there's a delicate balance. Now, maybe that's factual for that specific NFL player, that specific lineman. 
maybe that is um, because his skill, his anthropometrics, these, these, these things don't line up optimally for him. And the only compensating factor that he has is substantial strength. That could be. Um, but the, the alignment between health and performance, I don't believe are as close. I, I don't think they're as parallel as, as we really think, um, as we'd like them to be. Uh, baseball players, every, I don't want to say every single baseball player, most successful baseball players will have a labral tear, right? And a lot of successful pitchers will have a labral tear in their hip. Why? Because it, facilis it facilitates lateral stride length. So none of these guys can do splits, but all these guys can do splits. You know what I mean? Like it's, and I've, I've had a baseball player with almost like an egg shaped femur. And what does that allow? Well, that allows, that allowed for the joint to go that much further while staying in place almost right. That, to, and he didn't have any hip pain really, but he threw 94 and he played for a very, very long time. So uh, to what extent, and later on in life, that's going to suck. He's going to need to get that removed because walking isn't the most important thing, but making money at this time is. Um, so it's, it's all about what the goals are. And I, I think we need to understand that a Bondarchuk making hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of throws in a spinning fashion on one side is not the healthiest thing in the world. Like we, we absolutely know that. Um, but there is a power um, in the general aspect of being symmet symmetrical. Um, Mickey Mantle was a switch hitter. And up until recently, he had one of the furthest balls ever hit. And he still does over 500 feet, right? And you see that a lot with uh, switch hitters. And they, they well, with the exception of Mickey Mantle, you look at a guy like Bernie Williams, who had power, who was a switch hitter and was able to play in the league for a longer time. Um, switch hitters have, in my anecdotal experience, less back pain. Now, they may have other shit, but a lot of things that plague baseball players um, with substantial power is lower back pain. And it's because you're constantly rotating, 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 rotating 100 swings off the tee every day, whatever it is. Like you're doing that one side. Whereas if you even everything out, it's not as bad. Um, you might be doing the same amount of rotations, but because it's equal on both sides, it's good. Um, it's, it's beneficial and it increases longevity of the career. No, man. I think that that, I think that's a really great example and one that can get people to think a little bit because when you're looking at it from 15,000 feet, you know, you think of the rotation aspect when it comes to that and throwing and how that's going to lead to all these issues. But yeah, I mean, it just makes sense that if you're, if you're taking a hundred swings off a tee one way versus let's say they take 75 each direction, even if it's just the fact that you've taken 25% away from the other side, you know, the, the whole kind of strength coach, idea of pull twice as much as you press, right? Like it all kind of, that should just make sense to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's, it's tough to understand what is needed and what isn't are, you know, cause I, cause the, the psychological aspect of preparation as well is huge, especially in sports like baseball and golf. Um, I remember years ago, uh, I had trained a golfer and he, had, he talked to me about this one golfer on tour that was supposed to be the next Tiger Woods. Um, I forget, I, I forget who it was supposed to be. He's supposed to be the next Tiger Woods. So it was incredible. And he got the shanks. Right. It's just like the, the yips in baseball where you just can't throw a strike no matter, no matter what, like he couldn't, couldn't, couldn't square it up. Um, and they asked him what the difference between him and Tiger Woods was. He says, Tiger Woods is a sociopath. Like the guy's, the guy's nuts. He's a, he's a narcissistic sociopath that knows he's perfect, that every swing he's ever had ever is perfect. And every time he swings and hits this ball, it's going to be the perfect shot. There's no doubt in his mind when it comes to playing. I'm not saying like from a regular person, you know, um, but in his mind, he said there was that 1% doubt. 
And that's what fucked him. And this guy was a super talented dude that no one's ever heard of. Um, so the mental aspect of baseball or, or sports, very skill oriented sports. Um, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic because I mean, look at Wade Boggs guy had to have a 30 pack. He had to finish his 30 pack on road trips before he started the game. And he had to eat, he had to like eat boiled chicken every single day for his entire fucking career or fried chicken, whatever the hell it was because of how he was upstairs. Now this guy's a hall of famer. How are you going to argue with him? Um, do, do I think he's out of his mind? Yeah. But I mean, even a guy like Chris Hogan has his pregame CD or a CD just aged myself pregame playlist, you know, um, everyone. And even me on my way to games, I would have a certain song that I had to listen to. Uh, I remember one year, my sophomore year of college, we were late uh, getting on the bus because of me, because there was a song that I had to hear on the fucking radio. And it was before we had like MP3 players really that prevalent. Um, I had to hear a song on the fucking radio before we left. Otherwise, like I wasn't going to have a good game and everyone let me do it because, you know, I was, I was a guy on the team, but we were late because of that. So it, it was and the psychological aspect of it. It, it was real. Like I genuinely believed it. So if you believe something to your core, so maybe it, it, that it's going to impact you if you don't do it, then sometimes maybe that's just what you got to do. Um, it's, it's very it's very difficult to, to see the difference between the two. Um, so I, sometimes those 25 extra swings, you know, if, if really all you needed was 75 balls off the tee instead of the 50, the, the hundred balls off the tee or the one bucket instead of the two buckets, or I could have left five in the bucket, but in your head, that's, that mattered. Then how am I going to argue with that? I have no way to quantify, uh, quantify or objectively argue that um, with any data. So, man, you know you better than I do. What the fuck am I going to say? Yeah, I think that that's a spot where a lot of coaches get themselves into trouble. And I think that's a good lead-in to the, the big three questions here, Mike. So let's get these rolling. But first, this portion of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric. Eccentric is the world leader in flywheel technology, and this year is celebrating 10 years of being just that. The addition of the Eccentric K-Box and K-Pulley to both our return to sport and general physical preparation programs have had immense positive effects on our athletes. For more information or check out the awesome catalog of products that Eccentric provides, hop on over to Eccentric.com today and make sure you let them know that CVASPS sent you. So if you wouldn't mind, bro, I mean, you've, you've seen a lot. I mean, you've been a guy who's been pigeonholed as an expert and then not knowing anything in multiple sports. So where, where are some, some mistakes you see made in our field? Man? And, and not just in America, but it could be around the world. And how do you feel we could do things a little differently to correct? Them? You see that latest picture of Tyson Fury that everyone posted. This is what the ideal male looks like. This is what peak performance looks like. Uh, you know, a 275 pound dad bod, you know, uh, I think that's a big mistake. And I've been alluding to that essentially this entire podcast that it's never what we think it is. Like I love one of the main reasons I got into strength and conditioning was because of Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I've, I've been watching his movies my entire life. Like you're supposed to look good. Look at him predator, him and Carl Weathers fucking shirts off, jacked up. You know, looking that way, that's what peak performance looks like. Uh, Ivan Drago, Rocky IV, like I loved him. That was awesome to me. A precise way to train people and the most perfectly trained athlete ever. And that's what he looks like. And then when you go and you look at these boxing matches and you see some of these guys, they're just slobs and they just, they, they crush. So I think where, I mean, I, I shouldn't say it's the biggest mistake, but a very big mistake we make is we... We associate body comps with performance. That's how we gauge things. Um, there's ideal things. There's ideal physiques that we look for. Um, and we try to fit square pegs in round holes as if to exemplify the success or the effort that the person gave into training this year. Whereas sometimes I had a, I had a big league pitcher tell me about the zero diet. I said, what's a zero diet? He goes, anything shaped like a zero you can eat or drink. I said, what, the, what, 
what are you talking about? He goes, well, the goal is to throw zeros up in the bullpen. So you got to eat things that look like zeros. So you can't have a slice of pizza. You have to have the whole pizza. You can't have part of a donut. You have to eat the entire donut. You could drink a beer because it's a circle. You got to drink the whole thing. So I, now look at pictures, though. You have some of these pictures. They, I mean, you would never know that these guys are professional athletes. You would never have any idea that these are the epitome of mastery of sport and sport performance, right? And some of these guys will last forever for no rhyme or reason. So it's, and, and you, you can't, we don't know. We don't know anything. We think we, we think we know something and we know nothing. You know, it's, it's, time line I right think there. that's the toughest fucking thing. That's a big time line right there. We think we know, but we don't know anything really. And I think that that's it, you know, like it, it's crazy too, that like, while to kind of connect all of it, right. Look good, feel good, play good actually might be a thing because confidence and psychology and all of this. But on the other side of it, right. If it's, if mental toughness as Hank likes to say is truly just trusting in your training. If you have a guy like Tyson Fury, who truly believes in his training and truly trusts what he does and knows that his skill set is superior he doesn't care what he looks like because he knows at the end of the day, you're looking up at him. Yep. I remember watching, remember Tim Silva? Oh yeah. A six foot eight flat footed slob that just, he was champion of the UFC for a long time. You know what I mean? Like I, I, you know, like it, it, physique, physique and performance don't coincide. I look at Chad Ocho Cinco McDonald's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Are you going to tell me that this man is wrong? It worked. And how many years was he in the NFL? He's a Hall of Famer. Is he, is he, a Hall, is he going to be a Hall of Famer? Uh, I mean, probably should be. I mean, even like a better example, right? Is Gretzky was what, like two hot dogs or a hot dog, a Snickers bar, and a Coke before every game? Is that what it was? Something like that. Yeah, it was something. I mean, he was okay. You know, like. I have. I had this one kid on our podcast. He's the captain of the devils. I, I worked with him. Um, and one of, one of my, uh, the, the co-host of my podcast trains him exclusively pretty much. Um, he has no idea what makes him good. I've asked him multiple times like, Oh, well, what drills do you do with this? What drills do you do with that? Um, what's your diet? Like what's this and that he's, he's a 22 year old kid. You know, the answer to all of these questions. And he's, he's the captain of the fucking devils. So what, what am I supposed to, what am I going to do for this kid? Because I don't even, he doesn't even know what makes him good. I genuinely, we could say we do. We have no idea what makes these people good. hundred percent, bro. hundred percent. But in order for us to learn more and to be able to figure out more, we've got to improve our knowledge and, you know, looking at continuing education and growth professionally and things of that nature. Where do you feel like coaches in all the sectors, pro, college, private, can do better and like improve what they do professionally, you know, if they look into things. It may, and it can be any realm whatsoever. I think body work, um, to argue with uh, Michael Hope, I think body work is, is huge. I, I think all coaches should have a rudimentary understanding of massage and stretching, fascial stretching, I think those are two very important things that uh, coaches should utilize and, and should be able to. Um, it's, they're, they're, really, they're really important uh, to, to get to know your athletes, but as well as also addressing potential issues. Um, I've, with, with fascial stretching, basic fascial stretching, I've resolved so many back issues with, with two or three basic stretches, you know, um, it, and it, it, these are back issues that'll plague guys for a week. Like, you know, when you get out, oh, it's a kink. First, you're, you're stuck day one, day two, it gets a little better. And by, by the end of day seven, it's finally just a little bit of a kink that might be gone where you could wipe it out in one or two days. So I think, I think body work, having an understanding of the body and how to manipulate it with your hands um, or through showing people how to be in positions 
to stretch those muscles. Uh, I think that's huge. Yeah, and it's helped me out. Mm -hmm. It's helped me out a lot. There's been days I couldn't touch my knees, let alone tie my toes or tie my shoes, tie my toes, tie my shoes. And, uh, you know, some of that stuff that you sent me, it started getting me running down some rabbit holes. That's for sure, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that stuff is super important. Um, the Eldoa stretches, for those of you wondering where to go, Eldoa stretches are a great place to start. Um, it's an expensive certification. I, you know, knowing how to do these stretches properly and to do that stuff, I think is worth every penny. 100%. Well, let me get you out of here on this then, Mike. What should people expect from you at the seminar? So, I mean, you know, jack of all trades, master of none sort of thing. Um, I, I'm not Usain Bolt's sprint coach. I'm not Michael Jordan's shooting coach. Um, I'm not, you know, anyone's pitching coach or anything like that. I, I know a little bit of a decent amount of things. And I think one of the, one of the, my favorite things going to your seminar was the philosophical aspects that people would bring up and then the specific things that people can do to help right away. Um, taking home that thing right away that will help you instantly um, and improve your program is, is really important. And I think I'm going to give just it, not a random list, but my talk will be things that I learned in strength conditioning that took months for me to, to understand. And I'm going to present on these individual topics and situations and give you guys all things to think about, but to solve, to help you solve problems fairly quickly. Freaking rad, bro. Stoked to, stoked to see it. Stoked to have his part of it, dude. Hope you can make it to Pittsburgh also, but understand you may be a little bit busy at that time. But as always, Godango, it's great to see you, bro. I'm glad you're doing great, man. It's great to catch up. Bro, thank you so much for having me on the podcast again. Again, it's it's an honor. Well, I appreciate you, brother. And we'll be in touch real soon, homie. Thanks. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. Cheers. Unfortunately, since the recording of this show, we have had to make one change to the lineup. Anthony Paroli will not be able to be there April 29th and 30th at Union Fitness at the Pittsburgh Seminar. We have added Dr. Josh Nelson, which is going to be absolutely fantastic. Couldn't be more excited to welcome Nelly back to CVASP. He was absolutely sensational last summer at the virtual seminar, and I'm super stoked to welcome Josh Nelson uh, to the event and can't be more excited to get him there, but again, uh, um, Anthony was brought up a couple times in the show, so I wanted to make sure, full disclosure, that everyone knows exactly what the lineup is. So I apologize that Anthony will not be able to be there, but we're really excited to have Nelly there. and Couldn't be happier for the lineup we have. Hope to see you guys in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Union Fitness, April 29th and 30th. But as always, thank you for everything you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest and another awesome presenter at the seminar. We will see you then.